This video is made possible by Audible. Use my link, audible.com forward slash biographics or text biographics to 500 500 in the US only to get a free book. Plus, you get two Audible originals and a 30 day free trial. It's all for free. Just click the link in the description below. Isuroku Yamamoto was the mastermind behind the worst attack on American soil ever. That attack on Pearl Harbor brought war with Japan, pitting Yamamoto against the best military minds of the U.S. armed forces. In the end, though, it took a clandestine mid-air assassination to bring him to heel. In this week's biographics, we examine the life of Isuroku Yamamoto. Yamamoto was born as Takano Isuraku on April 4, 1884, in the town of Nagaoka on the island of Honshu. His father, Takano Sadayoshi, had been involved in an unsuccessful samurai-led rebellion against the imperial government back in 1877. The government's subsequent crackdown on the samurai made it difficult for Takano to find work, and he was forced to move all over Honshu trying to secure a job. After returning to Nagaoka, his wife died, and soon after, he married his younger sister-in-law. Together, they had three children. The youngest of these was Isuroku. The name means 56, which was his father's age when he was born. Takano was an educated man who, when he could find a position, worked as a schoolteacher. He passed his appreciation for knowledge on to his children, the most gifted of whom was Isuroku. The boy saw education as the route to breaking the cycle of poverty that was his lot in life. In 1901, Isiroku's diligence and application to his studies paid off when he won an appointment to the Imperial Navy Academy. In fact, his application test score was the second highest in the entire country. For the next three years, between the ages of 16 and 19, he lived at the Naval Academy at Etajima City near Hiroshima in the southern part of Japan. Life at the academy was Spartan, disciplined. Isiroku acquitted himself competently, but it was during the fourth year of the cadetship, which was spent at sea, that he really began to shine. His naval trainers quickly recognized leadership qualities in the man. Despite only standing at 5 foot 3 inches and weighing around 120 pounds, he was physically skilled, being adept at both gymnastics and the martial art kendo. Unlike most other students, he was not interested in drinking and socializing, but would rather spend his time reading the Bible and getting ahead on his studies. In November of 1904, Isuroku graduated from the Naval Academy 7th out of 200. Since February of that year, Japan had been at war with Russia, and Isuroku was immediately thrown right into the fray. It was assigned to the warship Nishin. On the night of May 26, 1905, the climactic battle of the war began, with the Russian Baltic fleet attacking the Japanese fleet in the Tushishima Strait. The Nishin was one of eight Imperial ships present out of 89 total ships. With more modern ships, greater speed, and better trained crews, the Japanese emerged victorious, with 21 Russian ships being sunk and 7 being captured. It was the victory that the Japanese had been desperately needing, and it propelled them to final victory. However, for Isiroku, the price for victory it was dear. One of the gun barrels on board his ship had burst with the shrapnel flying everywhere. He caught a large piece of metal in the thigh and dozens of smaller fragments peppered all throughout his lower body. In addition, two of his fingers were hanging by just a thread. He was evacuated to a hospital and did not return to duty until August the 5th. Still, he was recognized for his bravery in this first test under fire with a letter of citation and personal commendation from Admiral Haichihiro Togo. After recovering from his injuries, Isuroku served on three ships. On one of them, he traveled to the west coast of the United States, giving him his first American interaction. In 1908, Isuroku completed a basic course at the Naval Gunnery School, going on to graduate from the advanced course in 1911. He then spent time on a battleship before attending the Naval Staff College in 1913. Isuroku excelled in staff training, being earmarked by his tutors as a man on the rise. Following his graduation in 1916, he was appointed to the 2nd Battle Squadron as a lieutenant commander. It was around this time that Takano Isiroku became Yamamoto Isiroku. With both his parents having died in 1912 and having older brothers, it was clear that Isiroku would never come to head the Takano clan. 
Yet the Yamamoto clan was in need of a new male heir. The clan saw the rising young naval officer as the perfect fit. This adopting of a man into a family in order to serve as the male heir was quite a common practice, and it was accepted by Isuraku. However, it required that he find a wife and have sons to continue the Yamamoto name. It was at the age of 34, in 1918, that Isuraku entered into an arranged marriage. A few months later, in 1919, he was assigned to the United States to take up an assignment as a naval representative. He spent a month at Harvard University studying the English language. He then continued to study independently to master English, while also learning all he could about the oil industry, which was vital to the operation of an efficient navy. While in the U.S., he also picked up a penchant for gambling, at which he proved to be quite successful. In fact, he undertook a tour of Mexican oil fields, which was partly financed from his gambling proceeds. In 1921, Isuraku returned to Japan, where he received a posting as an instructor at the Naval Staff College. Over the five years of his service in this capacity, he deepened his knowledge of oil while also developing a fascination with aviation. In 1926, he was assigned to the United States for a second time, where he stayed for two years. Isuraku's two great passions combined in 1928 when he was given command of the Imperial Navy's first aircraft carrier, Akaji. He retained this post for a little over a year. Within that time, he developed a strong bond with the men under his command who greatly admired their strict but fair commander. Usuroku's mastery of the English language made him a valuable asset to the Japanese high command, and in October of 1929 he was stationed to London to act as an assistant to the Japanese delegation to the London Naval Conference of 1930. During his time in London, he received the news that he had been promoted to Rear Admiral. Back in Japan, Yamamoto was given yet another role within the Imperial Navy. He became head of the Technical Division of the Aeronautics Department. After three years, he then found himself back in command of the Akagi. He threw himself into this role, disciplining and training his aviators with absolute precision. However, eight months into this role, he was again selected for service overseas. The preliminary discussions for the Second London Naval Conference took place in London in October of 1934, and Yamamoto was selected as a chief delegate. He was tasked with pressing Japan's claim for a better naval construction ratio, which had previously been set at 60% of the battleship and carrier strength of the United States and Britain. Despite his own personal misgivings, he proved to be the right man for the job. His opposition negotiators from Britain and the US were impressed with his intelligence and his reasonableness. He put the demands from his government on the table, which were for naval priority with the other two powers. This was never going to be acceptable to the Brits and the Americans, and Yamamoto, he knew this. The negotiations, they went nowhere, and the conference broke up without resolution. Even though he had not been able to achieve his government's ambitions, Yamamoto's prominence at the conference had made him internationally famous. Yet, when he returned to Japan, he faced a period of stagnation which was very troubling to him. In fact, he seriously considered at this point resigning from the Navy. Yamamoto's funk it was resolved, though, in December of 1935 when he was appointed Chief of the Aeronautics Department at the Navy Ministry. He was now the boss of everything to do with naval aviation in Japan. This gave him the ability to put into development some of the concepts that he had previously worked on. These included the Type 96 land-based attack plane. This was the most advanced attack plane possessed by any navy in the world and would form a central part of Yamamoto's offensive plans against the United States. Now, on February the 26th, 1936, there was an attempted military coup in Japan. The nationalistic government placed Admiral Nagani Asama as the new minister of the navy. Yamamoto accepted the position of vice navy minister. He set about reinstilling a lost discipline in the navy's command, dismissing those who didn't meet his standards. He also actively worked to prevent the army's push towards war. Nineteen thirty seven was to prove to be a key year in the advancement of Japan's war stance. In the wake of starting a war on her doorstep with China, she signed a tripartite pact with Germany and Italy. Yamamoto was against the pact, and he wasn't shy about voicing his opinion. This brought him into increasing conflict with the army administration and their right wing followers. He received numerous death threats. These didn't phase him, and he appears to have accepted that sooner or later he would simply be 
assassinated. A crisis occurred in 1939. This was when the Germans signed a non-aggression pact with Russia, the traditional enemies of the Japanese. On August the 23rd, the entire Japanese cabinet resigned, resulting in Yamamoto's loss of his position as Vice Navy Minister, along with his superior, Navy Minister Yanai. Before leaving office, however, Yanai had appointed Yamamoto as the Commander-in-Chief of the Combined Imperial Fleet. Yamamoto was a highly experienced commander, and he had the respect of his men. He was seen as a pacifist at a time when the country was marching towards war. However, he threw himself into the position with his usual gusto, pushing aside his own reservations and stepping up training and preparation for the coming conflict. By the end of 1940, the pro-German factions within the armed forces were driving the country towards a conflict with the United States. Though personally opposed to taking on the US, Yamamoto began planning for such an eventuality. He was adamant that the only chance for success against America lay with a massive surprise attack that would take out the American fleet, followed up by the blitzkrieg-like tactics that the Germans were using with such positive effects in Europe. He repeatedly stated that if a war was to be won against the United States, it had to be completed within six months. Otherwise, the economic and manpower advantage of the Americans would inevitably prevail. In July 1941, the United States responded to continued Japanese aggression in China by imposing a trade embargo on Japan and freezing all Japanese assets in its country. Britain and the Netherlands, they quickly followed suit. The most crippling effect was the loss of oil imports, which accounted for 90% of Japan's usage. And, of course, the largest user of oil in the country was Japan's Imperial Navy. The Japanese response was to further step up preparation for war, while also looking to seize control of the oil reserves held in the Dutch East Indies and that the British had in the Far East. Yamamoto believed that any attack on Dutch or British possessions would draw the Americans into an armed conflict. It was at this time that Yamamoto formulated the plan for a decisive, preemptive strike on the American naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. He believed that such a crushing blow would destroy American morale and lead to a negotiated peace settlement. The plan was risky, and many officials were opposed to it. It speaks volumes about Yamamoto's prestige and influence that he was able to push the plan through to a final approval. The plan was actually rejected by the Navy General Staff several times, but finally Yamamoto had to put his foot down. As long as he was commander-in-chief, he told his commanders, the Pearl Harbor attack would go ahead. He then went to the Naval General Staff and told them that unless the plan was approved, he and his entire staff would resign. The idea of going to war without Yamamoto was a scary prospect to the Navy brass, and they finally relented. Yamamoto's plan for Pearl Harbor was to sink as many battleships as possible. He saw the battleship as the symbol of American naval superiority and figured that the sudden loss of the majority of their reserve would destroy the American fighting spirit. However, Staff Air Officer for the 1st Air Fleet, Minoru Ganada, felt that it was more advantageous to concentrate on sinking American aircraft carriers. In the end, a compromise was reached. The first wave of the attack, comprising of 40 torpedo planes, would be directed at two carriers. The other 24 planes would focus on the eight battleships that could also potentially be there. Another 50 level bombers were to head for Battleship Row, where most of the battleships were expected to be berthed. Meanwhile, 54 dive bombers with escorting fighters were to attack the oil fields on Oahu. The second wave of the attack was to comprise 81 dive bombers and was intended to finish off the cruisers, with their bombs being too small to damage the battleships. As it turned out, the attack during the early hours of December 7, 1941, was far more successful in its targeting of battleships than cruisers, none of which were actually in the dock that day. The battleships Oklahoma and West Virginia were sunk, while the California was struck with two torpedoes eventually sinking, and the Nevada with a single strike that also brought her down. All of this was achieved in only 11 minutes. In Battleship Row, the Arizona was struck with a 1,760-pound armor-piercing bomb. The forward magazine of the ship exploded, killing 1,177 officers and crewmen. The attack was a complete success, achieving Yamamoto's objective of decimating American naval power in one fell swoop. 18 ships had been sunk or damaged, while only 29 Japanese aircraft had been shot down. Most pleasing to Yamamoto was that five battleships had either been sunk or beached. 
In the bigger picture of things, however, the attack at Pearl Harbor it achieved little. Yamamoto's emphasis on destroying battleships it was not a sound policy. The Americans were already moving towards carriers rather than battleships, and the Pearl Harbor attack merely sped up this transition. Furthermore, rather than breaking American morale, as Yamamoto had thought, the attack served as a rallying cry to drive the Americans on to final victory. With the United States' declaration of war against Japan on December 8, 1941, the Japanese had to devise a strategy to overcome this far greater power. It was decided to fight a defensive campaign where the Americans would be drawn into the Pacific East and worn down to the point of accepting a negotiated peace settlement. Meanwhile, the Japanese would occupy key territories in the Asia-Pacific, moving down into Australasia and the Central Pacific. Yamamoto believed that when Singapore was taken, the time would be right to sue for peace. With the success of his brainchild, the Pearl Harbor attack, Yamamoto's influence grew. He was instrumental in planning invasions on Malaysia and the Philippines, as well as Guam and Singapore. In early February of 1942, he moved his staff headquarters onto the super battleship Yamato. With Singapore having fallen, Yamamoto believed that it was time for his government to pressure the Allies for peace. Its lack of action on this greatly frustrated him. Despite his conviction that a campaign that went for more than six months would be disastrous, he was forced to plan out the next phase of the war. However, his ideas were at odds with the naval general staff who wanted to concentrate on Australia, where, as he was intent on taking control of the Indian subcontinent. The army, however, refused to back such a plan, and it was quickly taken off the table. The first major setback for the Japanese occurred with the Battle of Coral Sea between May 4th and 8th, 1942, which successfully halted the Japanese invasion of New Guinea. Yamamoto continued to butt heads with the naval general staff as he now proposed an attack on Midway Atoll that would draw out the remnant of the American fleet from Hawaii, where it could be utterly destroyed. Resistance was stiff, with general staff members pointing out that Midway was too close to Pearl Harbor and too far away from Japan. Yamamoto now used his old tactic of threatening to resign, and he got his way again. The attack on Midway required Yamamoto to coordinate his fleet over huge stretches of water. Yamamoto, aboard the Yamato, personally led one battle group himself. What he didn't know was that the Americans had broken their secret codes and were already aware of the attack in advance. Three U.S. carriers were sent to Midway in order to surprise the Japanese. In the ensuing battle, four Japanese carriers were sent to the bottom of the ocean. Acknowledging defeat, Yamamoto ordered his remaining ships back to base. The defeat at Midway was a humiliation for Yamamoto, and he received much criticism for it. Still, he was able to retain his position as commander-in-chief, largely because to remove him would have been too demoralizing for the men under his command. Over the next few months, the Japanese achieved limited success against the fleet around Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. The Battle of Guadalcanal, however, was another crushing defeat for the Japanese. In the wake of Guadalcanal, Yamamoto set out on a morale-boosting tour of Air Force bases across the South Pacific. On April 14, 1943, a message which announced his exact itinerary en route to a base in the Solomon Islands was intercepted by U.S. intelligence. This presented the Americans with the perfect opportunity to assassinate the Japanese naval commander-in-chief. It was a risk in that it would betray the Americans' ability to break Japanese code, but Yamamoto was seen as such a big fish that it was deemed worth giving up this intelligence. A plan, nicknamed Operation Vengeance, was put into operation with the objective of killing Yamamoto. 18 U.S. fighter pilots were chosen from the base at Guadalcanal to participate in the operation. 14 of them would provide cover at around 20,000 feet, while four others formed a strike force to blow Yamamoto's plane right out of the sky. The attack it was set for April the 18th. That morning, there was not one, but two G4M1 Type 1 Betty bombers, along with six A6M0 fighters, to provide escort in Yamamoto's fleet. It wasn't long into the flight when the four American P-38s were seen approaching. The bomber that was carrying Yamamoto immediately began to descend, while the escort planes moved in to intercept the Americans. But they weren't able to prevent the P-38s from achieving their objectives, with both of the Betty bombers receiving strikes. Both of the planes crashed. However, an autopsy on his body revealed that Yamamoto, who was sitting on the starboard side of the plane behind the plane commander, had been struck by bullets to the jaw and shoulder and was probably dead before the plane hit the ground. Yamamoto's body was found later that day. It had been thrown from the wreckage, still strapped to the seat. 
The death of Yamamoto was not revealed to the Japanese people until May the 21st, more than a month after he was shot down. More than a million people lined the streets of Tokyo as his ashes passed by. So today's video was made possible by Audible, who I'm sure many of you know about already. I've been a long-time customer of Audible, reading tons of books on all sorts of subjects. In fact, it's kind of a funny story. I personally really love autobiographies and biographies, and listening to those through Audible are what actually inspired me to start this channel. No kidding, it all kind of came full circle, so thanks for that, Audible. There are loads of autobiographies on Audible, and I bet that if it's a notable book, there's going to be a cool audiobook version of it as well. Also related to this video, there are tons of audiobooks on World War II, the Pacific Theater, Pearl Harbor itself, lots and lots of those. I just did a quick search and the entire first page of results are all super highly rated books about this attack and its consequences. Now Audible was always a good deal, you got an audiobook a month for a low fee, but now there's even more. In addition, members now get two Audible originals every single month in addition to their book of choice. These are from some of the world's most celebrated storytellers, journalists, novelists, and many others. There's plenty to choose from. There's also fitness and health workouts for members. So Audible was always great, but now there's even more. If you've been putting off signing up for it, do so no longer. Go search Pearl Harbor in Audible and grab something that takes your fancy. There's loads of great reviewed books, like I say. Just go to audible.com forward slash biographics. There's also a link in the description below. Doing that also helps support this show and helps us keep more biographics videos coming your way. Again, get started with a free book now with a 30-day free trial at audible.com forward slash biographics. Or if you're in America, text biographics graphics to 500 500. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos twice a week. So hit that subscribe button, hit that bell button if you really want to get notifications. And as always, thank you for watching.